Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I work through another one of the models on Validia. This time we walk through the value investing method developed and outlined by Joseph Piotrowski and in his paper, Value Investing, the Use of Historical Financial Statement Information to Separate Winners from Losers. This systematic model attempts to uncover stocks that look cheap based on the academic definition of value using the price to book, but then uses a series of accounting and financial tests to separate those value stocks that are seeing improvements in their business from those that are not. This test creates what is known as the F-score, and investors looking for good value stocks can use the F-score in their analysis and filtering between good and bad value stocks and opportunities in the market. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoy this discussion. And oh, by the way, on Validia, we track a model based on the Piotrowski method, and you can screen for stocks using the F-score. We calculate this on a daily basis on thousands of stocks. Okay, today we're going to talk about one of the models we run on Validia. And it's based on an academic paper that was written actually in the early 2000s um, by a professor who was at the University of Chicago um, Graduate School of Business. And the gentleman's name was uh, jo- or is Joseph Piotrowski. And um, he wrote a paper titled Value Investing, the Use of Historical Financial Statement Information to Separate Winners from Losers. And today we're going to talk about what goes into that strategy, how it tries to uncover value stocks that are um, seeing improvements in their financials or deteriorations in their financials because this test was a long, short strategy, which we'll talk about. But um, uh, Piotrowski uh, is currently at Stanford. Uh, He teaches um, the MBA class on value investing and accounting there, I believe. And what was interesting was this paper was, in some ways, it was kind of groundbreaking at the time because I, I think it might have been one of the first papers that tried to couple this idea of trying to harvest the value premium, but also um, doing it in such a way where you're trying to look for companies that are seeing sort of improvements in their financials and in their operations. Um, so with that, Jack, I'll just toss it over to you. And if you want to kind of flush out the strategy a little bit more and talk about some of the stuff in the paper, that'd be great. Yeah, as you alluded to, the the academic research prior to this was really focused on, you know, the value factor in general. So the idea was, you know, I'm I'm long, cheap stocks, I'm short, expensive stocks. And, you know, I I get the difference there. Um, You know, what what this really did is this brought in the idea that when when you look at the long side of, of value, you know, buying cheap stocks and you look at the returns in there, you look at the composition of the individual positions, what you'll find is some value stocks are cheap for a reason and some value stocks, the market has overestimated how bad things are. And so what this strategy is trying to do is saying, all right, let's not treat all value stocks the same in there. Let's try to say, can we filter out some of these stocks that are cheap for a reason or that where the situation is actually worse than the market thinks? You know, can we take those stocks and can we filter them out? And so this is also a long, short paper, but because of that, what this ends up being is a different type of long, short paper. So in this paper, instead of being long, cheap stocks and short, expensive stocks, I'm long, cheap stocks and I'm short, cheap stocks. But the difference is I'm long the cheap stocks with what we'll talk about F score in a second, but I'm long the cheap stocks that are of higher quality or have have high F scores. And I'm short the cheap stocks that have low F scores. And so I'm trying to get at, instead of trying to get at the difference between cheap and expensive, I'm trying to get at the difference between higher quality cheap versus lower quality cheap. Yeah, what I think he also found in the paper was that, you know, I think like 44% of um, low price to book stocks actually uh, didn't have positive returns over time. Um, So, you know, that just goes to show that a lot of a lot of like these value stocks, you know, actually don't end up um, going on to make money. So the idea of trying to separate and find those ones and, you know, discriminate between the strong and the weak companies is certainly something that um, you know that Piotrowski was trying to uncover. So in the in the paper, um, what the strategy showed when he ran this long short uh, back test is um, the model or the strategy generated a 23% annualized return from the period of 1976 to 1996. So I think you know it when people read this, they were obviously very impressed by it because um, that degree of you know 23% returns over a 20 year period of time is 
is um, pretty impressive for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and this is, this gets to the whole idea was, you know, we've talked about this when we did our value trap podcast a while back, you know, this whole idea of if you can get, you know, a value strategy is going to have a bunch of companies that don't do well in there. So if you can find a way to maybe filter out, filter the good compared to the bad, um, you know, it can really make a huge difference in your returns. And so this is sort of like the holy grail of value investing. So yeah, he, he sort of showed, yeah, yes, you can distinguish between value stocks. You know, it's not just value stocks are all very similar. You know, you can use like these quality metrics to distinguish companies that go on to do better versus companies that don't do as well. So the, the idea, he came up with this F score, which is a, a scoring system basically to, that looks at various financials and accounting metrics and tries to give companies a score based on each of these things, which we'll walk through. And then, you know, the, what the model is doing is trying to go, in our case, we go just long only the top 10 or 20 securities that get the highest F score in Piotrowski's study. He went, um, you know, long with the best scoring ones and shorted the, the worst, as we've talked about. Um, but do you want to kind of start to work through some of the components of the F score so we can get into it? Sure. So, yeah, so the F score, what it is, is just basically nine tests. Um, and and they're, they're in sort of three different categories. And the score ends up being zero to nine, depending on how many of, of the tests a specific company um, passes. And they're sort of developed, they're in three different groups. You know, one group is profitability, one group is leverage, liquidity, and source of funds, and one group is operating efficiency. So inside of each one of those groups is, is a series of tests. And so the individual tests are inside of profitability. Well, first of all, we should maybe talk about why they're important. So he said in the paper with regard to profitability, current profitability and cash flow realizations provide information about a firm's ability to generate funds internally. Given the poor historical earnings performance of value firms, any firm currently generating positive cash flow or profits is demonstrating a capacity to generate funds through operating activities. And so that makes sense at a high level. Obviously, the more, the more profitable a firm is, the better chance they have to succeed in the future. So it makes sense to maybe look at some of these value stocks and say, you know, look at some of the measures of profitability to see how well the company's doing. And so he looked at three. He looked at return on assets. Um, he looked at change in return on assets. And then he looked at cash flow from operations. Um, so in the case of return on assets, he required the return on assets for the most recent year be positive. Um, in the case of return on, on and change of return on assets, he required that the return on assets for the most fiscal, the most recent fiscal year must be greater than the return on assets for the previous fiscal year. And then in terms of cash flow from operations, he required that, um, the cash flow from operations for the most recent fiscal year must also be positive. So those three are his profitability tests. Um, and then he moves on to, uh, or actually, sorry, there's, there's one more, uh, profitability test. It's cash compared to net income. So you're, again, you're looking at the, the cash from operations for the most recent fiscal year must be greater than net income for the most recent fiscal year. Um, so those are the profitability metrics. And, and then he moves on to leverage liquidity and source of funds. And so again, just thinking about it at a high level, what, what he said is since most high book to market firms are financially constrained, I assume that an increase in leverage, a deterioration in liquidity, or the use of external financing is a bad signal about financial risk which makes a lot of sense. And so in that category, he has three. He has change in long-term debt. So long-term debt to assets for the most recent fiscal year must be less than or equal to the previous fiscal year. Change in current ratio. Um, the current ratio for the most recent fiscal year must be greater than the current ratio for the previous fiscal year. And then shares outstanding. The issuance of new stock is considered by this methodology to be a sign of a company that a company is not able to generate enough internal cash to fund its business. Therefore, shares outstanding for the most recent fiscal year must be less than or equal to shares outstanding for the previous fiscal year. So that, that gets into the um, that category, the leverage, liquidity, and source of funds. And then the final category is the operating efficiency. So that's change in gross margin and change in asset turnover. So um, what, what that's looking for is that the gross margin for the most recent fiscal year must be greater than the gross margin for the, most, for the previous fiscal year. And a lot of these are, have the same thing in common, which is we're taking the current fiscal year and we're comparing it to the one before. Um, and then the same thing with asset turnover. The, the most recent fiscal year has to be greater than um, the previous fiscal year. So basically, it's just a, it's a, what you're doing at a high level is you're saying, all right, I know some of these stocks are cheap for a reason. And I'm trying to identify ones that have significant problems in their business, whether it be too much debt or you know, they're not profitable enough or, or whatever. I'm, I'm trying to use these nine criteria to say, can I separate the good from the bad? That was a great um, overview. Um, but the, the universe of stocks, I'm not sure if you mentioned this or not, it starts with the cheapest 20% of stocks in the market using the um, price to book or the inverse of that is the book to market ratio, which is what they kind of use in the academic uh, literature. Um, so it starts there and then it kind of goes into all those criteria, which you outlined, um, very, very well. Um, one of the other things that, that, um, comes through in the test or in his findings is that a big part of the benefit, um, in terms of the return for the long side. So the, so the good value stocks 
is actually from small and mid caps. So that's where a lot of the alpha comes from. It's trying to find, you know, relatively small companies that are, you know, underfollowed by um, the analyst community. That was one of the things that he pointed out. And then there is this idea about this. He highlighted in the paper that a lot of the returns also come around these periods of earnings announcements and how they're the market sort of, it, it, there's a delay with investors in terms of reacting to improved financial, uh, to the improved financial situation or metrics of a company. And then when the company has its earnings announcements and the ones that actually are seeing improvement in earnings, um, the market tends to, a lot of the returns tend to come around those periods of time. So those are two additional sort of characteristics that, you know, is vetted out in the, in the underlying, um, data and the performance of the strategy. But as we were talking about before, Jack, um, we started, you know, the strat, at least the, the one that we run on Validia, uh, which is again, long only, you know, certainly it's been a tough, tough decade for, um, this type of investment style and approach. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it was, it was a bad decade for value in general, but if, if you went inside the individual value metrics, I mean, what you'd find it was, it was worse for price to book than it was for pretty much anything else. And so that, that thing that I failed to mention at the beginning, which you correctly uh, added at the end, the whole idea that this takes the 20% cheapest stocks based on price to book, that was a major problem for the strategy because there was almost nothing, you know, putting F score aside for a second, if you were operating in that cheapest 20% with price to book, there was almost nothing you could have done in the past decade to have even a reasonable return because that, that universe of that bottom 20%, you know, did so poorly that, you know, F score wasn't going to save you. you know, there was really nothing that was going to save you down there. You know, one of the interesting things with this though, is F scores really can be carried to any sort of value approach. And so if you're not a believer in price to book, and we've certainly talked about some of the negatives of price to book, you could use a different value metric to select your cheap stocks and then use F score. Or if you don't know which value metric is going to work, you could build a portfolio with a value composite and then use F score, you know, because all F score is trying to do is, is separate the good from the bad. And so how you define it doesn't how you know academics always tend to define value with price to book but as a practitioner following this you don't have to do that i mean you could define value in any way you think is appropriate you know to make to select these cheap stocks and then you could use f score to try to filter the good from the bad inside of that yeah that's a great point and by the way we do through our screening tool on validia we do allow you to filter on f score so you can put in a range of f score and then you can kind of couple that criteria or that f score with any other guru strategy or any other fundamental metric that we have on the screener. So that's how you could actually operationalize what Jack's talking about um, to sort of source new investment ideas. Um, one of the other things, Jack, that I know we've, we, we've talked about um, often with these value strategies is they do tend to work better when they're rebalanced uh, less frequently. So we, on Validia, we track monthly, monthly rebalance, quarterly rebalance, and annual rebalance portfolios. And, with the Piotrowski model, it tends to um, have the best performance when it's rebalanced annually. So that's another characteristic of some of these value strategies is you want to have a less frequent rebalancing approach. Yeah, you know, if you look at our strategies as a whole, you know, you, the most popular rebalancing that works the best is monthly um, across most strategies. But like you said, these deep value strategies tend to work better, surprisingly, you know, when you don't rebalance them a lot. And part of that is value just takes a while to be realized. And so if you're constantly churning, you know, looking for stocks that are a little bit cheaper than your previous group of stocks, you know, you don't get a lot of value from that. Whereas if, if you just buy some cheap stocks and you just hold them and give them time for that value to be realized, you know, from what we found in our testing for many of our value strategies, that ends up being a better approach. And it's also the other great thing about it is it's a much easier approach. You know, if I only have to rebalance my portfolio once a year, that's much easier than having to sit and come in there every month and try and do it. So we'll put a link to Piotrowski's paper um, in the show notes. And also you can learn more about the strategy, at least our implementation of it um, on Validia for those that are interested in uh, learning more. And we hope you guys found this uh, podcast interesting and valuable and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Hi guys, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube, or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.